Now let's stand together as we worship and sing. Amen. Let's stand together. So glad that you came in here on Palm Sunday. Jesus came through. He was riding a little coat. Amen. And he was, the people were all about him. And then later on we find out that, you know, so wait a minute. I don't know if we're ready for you yet, Jesus. <laughs> uh, but, you know, we're going to praise him. We're going to worship him. It's a great day to be alive. Amen. Come on.
Took the shackles off my feet There's no sound louder than the captives set free So let the redeemed of the Lord say so Sing of His promises Sweet victory, and there's no sound louder than a captive set free. No, there's no sound louder than a captive set free. So let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Sing of his promises. And Sunday and I uh, was reading through John 12 and uh, six days before the Passover G Jesus he was in Bethany he was in the house of Lazarus whom he had raised from the dead so there's a lot of stuff going on right there but one of the things that has always captivated me is finding times in the Bible where just they were just great moments of worship Mary was there, and Mary had poured out a whole jar of very valuable perfume. And a lot of people there were like, what's going on here? But Jesus kind of rebuked them and said, look, you, you know, you all don't get it. She gets it. She had poured out her worship for Jesus in that moment. Judas Iscariot was like, man, we could have sold that. We could have sold that and, and fed the poor. We could have done so much to, you know. But it was the heart that she had. She came with a heart of worship and gave what she had. She poured out. What a moment of worship. Today, as we get ready to partake in communion, let's just continue that heart of worship. hold that little cup and a little piece of bread 
it just symbolizes it just is such a big symbol of what Jesus did for us would you just bow your heads with me for a moment Heavenly Father we just thank you we thank you for this time that we get to come together where we've already worshipped you throughout the week we have this, this is a form of worship as we have gathered here in your name to celebrate you to worship you in spirit and truth God would you just transform our hearts you're a God that transforms like no other thing on this earth so we thank you Lord today that as we take that cup of juice let us remember the blood that was poured out and your bread you are the bread of life and your body was broken for for our peace today for healing so we love you today Lord and we give you all the praise in Jesus name amen you can come we have stations on the side the back and the front This old song, it says it is well. An old song that we've sang for many years, but when this song is written, written in a time of trouble, persecution, defeat, it speaks so much more. You sing with us.
side The clouds be rolled back As a scroll The drum shall resound And the Lord shall descend Even so
come to worship why is this an important part of your life is it because it's well with your soul and troubled past and troubled waters have been made smooth is it because you know that you used to be a huge slave to sin and now you're not Or is it because it's not well with your soul and you're still very much held captive and you're looking for hope? It doesn't matter any of those reasons or any more. We're here because God loves us. And Jesus died for us. And God's doing incredible, incredible stuff on the hill. You got to see another baptism on video before the service. We know at least three more in the next service. And so if you've been thinking about it, just join the party. Come on. We're ready. We're ready. And more importantly, God is ready. But I want to challenge you this Palm Sunday to really spend some brain time asking yourself, why am I here? Why do I come to a church to worship? Why is this so important to me? We're in this series where we've been talking about taking it straight off the hill, taking the things that we learn here and take them out into our community. And, and over the last five weeks, we've gone up Mount Moriah with, with Abraham as he took his son up uh, to sacrifice only to be spared that cost. We, we've gone up the side of Mount Sinai, actually eight times if you remember, with Moses in the process of him going up to meet with God and get the commandments and bring him back down and try to lead the people. We've gone back up then the following week up the side of Mount Pisgah where, wow, humility was given as Moses uh, was instructed to look over into the promised land and to see everything that they had been living for, walking for, fighting for, all those things, but to be told, but you don't get to go in. You don't get to go in there because you didn't trust me completely and follow my instructions. Then we went up the side of Mount Carmel with Elijah for a huge, huge victory as he took on the, the prophets of Baal, the 500 demonic prophets of Baal and was victorious because of God and what God did and consuming his altar with fire. And it was that yeah moment where you know Elijah just somewhere in there had to flex and like yes yes and then we saw him come down the side of uh, Mount Carmel and flee to Mount Horeb running from that evil queen Jezebel only to be restored and refreshed by God on the side of that mountain as he came out of the cave and experienced God in a, in a quiet whisper well today we're transitioning from some Old Testament hills to some New Testament hills and we're going to be on them the remainder of this series. And this hill today is an interesting one because of, as, as Stu already said, it, it's Palm Sunday. And as he told you, Jesus had been in Bethany and he was making the trip down into Jerusalem for what we now know was going to be the last time. Jesus already knew that. 
And, and to go from Bethany down to Jerusalem, he had to walk down the side of what is known as the Mount of Olives. And so five days before the horror that would break out in the trial and ultimately the crucifixion, he's, he's marching into Jerusalem. And, and it's called Palm Sunday simply because Matthew and Mark in their biographies of Jesus' life while he was here on earth, they, they talk about how the people greeted Jesus with palm branches. They didn't have a fast sign store, something they could go get and welcome home signs or anything like that. They just did, what could they get? And they just started cutting branches off the palm trees and, and waving them, but also lining the road for him as a, as a sign of honor. The interesting thing about all this is, the day that they're shouting, bless, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The very same people Five days later, just five days later, are chanting, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. But today, today on Palm Sunday, it's a, a day of celebration. Praise is happening big time on the Mount of Olives. And Jesus had told them, the disciples, to go ahead and get a colt. Get a colt donkey and bring to him, a young, small donkey and bring to him. And so I want to pick up in Luke chapter 19 and verse 35. So if you got your Bibles or grab one other seat or get your tablet or your phone, whatever. Luke chapter 19, verse 35. Here's what it says. They brought that colt to Jesus and they threw their cloaks on it and put Jesus on it. Now, understand, be sure this is a colt of a donkey. This is not some like thoroughbred colt. This is like a donkey, okay? And as he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. And he, when he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for the miracles they had seen. And they were crying out, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven on our glory in the highest. Now, here's what I want you, before we finish up, here's what I want you to get in your mind. All right, I want you to think, there's, a, there's this turn from Bethany as you start down the Mount of Olives. And so it says that as he made this turn, as he started down, I want you to kind of imagine you're at your favorite team's athletic venue for the big game. And you know how now they all, whether it's football, basketball, whatever, they all come out of the tunnel and, and the cheerleaders lead them out and every play, the whole thing just explodes with excitement. If it's football games, there's typically smoke and everything that come running out. So it's kind of that atmosphere as Jesus makes this turn and starts down the Mount of Olives and the disciples, and, and when he said disciples here, not just talking about just the 12. All the followers of Jesus just kind of erupt in chanting and singing, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. And then verse 39, but some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, they didn't like it at all. They said, teacher, why don't you tell them to shut up? Loose translation once again, but very accurate. Why don't you rebuke your disciples? And he told them, he said, you know, even if I tell them to be quiet, the rocks will cry out. This is joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet. That's what, that's what he's letting them know. So what is it that makes us worship. This moment, this moment had so many worship facets. This worship moment has so many facets going on. The, the first thing that's going on here is this joyous celebration of the people. This, this, this just kind of, they finally just erupted and they couldn't, they couldn't stay quiet and just celebrates. But in the midst of this joyous celebration, there's also this frustrating disaster for the Pharisees that are in the crowd. Because they've been working really hard for the better part of the last three years to shut this guy up and to shut his followers up and to keep everything under control. And in that moment, if you think about it, in terms of that team coming out of the locker room and the celebration, in that moment, the Pharisees are like, uh, we've lost control of the situation. We are no longer calling the shots here. And they tried to, but Jesus told them, the, the rocks will worship me. So there's this joyous celebration. There's this frustrating disaster. But what's Jesus thinking? 
For Jesus, I think it's a bittersweet moment. He knew how the tide was going to turn in just a few short days. But for now, worship and praise are in the air. It's that feeling of anticipation and excitement that hopefully you get. I, I'd love it if you say you got it every time you drive up the hill. But at least sometimes that'll be. That's why we. That's why we have music in the parking lots, so that we would. It's like as soon as we get out of our cars and trucks, we want to start feeling like, oh, something's about to happen. Something's about to happen here. And some weeks it's just different than others. And there's just an energy that before, it, before the first note is ever played or video shown, there's just like, oh, today. You just feel it. It's just like, it, it's, it's on. You know, last, last weekend in, in our second service, uh, there were several that made commitment. And like, I just knew. I don't know. I don't, God, God's never spoken to me audibly. I, I don't know what to do with that. All right. But, but in my heart, I just knew. I just knew some people that were about to make this. And sure enough, they did. And it was just like there was an energy that was in the air. And that's what was going on here in this moment. And yet he knew. He knew what was coming. What is worship to you? What's worship to you? What does it mean to you? Is it, is it loud and exuberant like that afternoon on the Mount of Olives? Or is it maybe quiet and reverent like in the Garden of Gethsemane? Is it more, maybe for some of you sometimes, and maybe even today, you came here because it's more like crawling before God on your hands and knees and begging for mercy? What is it? Is it trying to buy favor by putting something really great in the offering box? Is it singing? Is it reading? Is it praying? Is it studying the Bible? Worship is one of those words that gets used a lot, but it usually means different things to different people. I'm going to jump all the way to the end right now. I'm going to go ahead and do what we do sometimes. I'm going to give you the bottom line right now for what we're going to talk about the rest of the morning. The bottom line is that worship empties us of ourself and fills us with the reality of God. Now, I think in its broadest sense, worship embodies a lifestyle of walking with God. And, and it's really not it's really not that much about what we do on Sunday morning or Thursday night for those that worship with them. Because here's the reality. These, these times that we show up here, they're give or take an hour. You know how many hours there are in a week? There's 168 hours in a week. And so you got, you got to think this through. We say, I love God so much. I'm going to give him one 168th of next week. Or is it more? Is, is worship how you live not only this hour? Is worship how you live when you get ready to leave and you go out in the parking lot and there's a new traffic flow pattern and you got to navigate all that? Are we still worshiping then? Uh, are we still worshiping when we get to Cracker Barrel and there's a line? Are we still worshiping when we get to Claudia's and there's a line? Are we still worshiping at home this afternoon when we want to do whatever we want to do and the, the cable's not working? Are we still worshiping tomorrow when we go into our office places and our factories and whatever it is that we do Monday through Friday? Are we still worshiping then? I think we're supposed to be. Here's what Paul said to the Colossian church. Check this out. Colossians chapter 3 verse 17. Whatever you do, are we good with that? We, we, we follow what he's saying there? Not, not like the kids, whatever. No, it's a different whatever. Whatever you do, whether in word or in deed. Remember the quote from St. Francis of Sissi? said, preach a sermon always, and if necessary, use words. All right? Whatever you do, whether in word or in deed, do it all in the name of of the Lord Jesus. So when we say that worship 
is at 7 o'clock Thursday and 9.30 and 11 on Sunday mornings, or if it's Easter week and that's 7 on Thursday and 7 on Friday and 8 o'clock, 9.30 and 11 on Sunday. See how I got the announcement in there in the middle of all that? When we say those things, we don't really mean that worship begins and ends at a specific time. Those are just the times of our corporate worship services. Because in a general sense, our whole life is supposed to be an offering for God. From the moment that we wake up until we lay our head, we say that we're going to sing of the mercy of God. When we sing that song, do we mean that? From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head down, I'm going to sing and show and worship the mercy of God. So see, our work, our leisure, our social interactions, our time in Bible study and prayer, even the time we spend doing the things of life to care for our bodies and care for our families, all those are acts of worship because God is glorified when we live a balanced life that honors Him. Now, thankfully, we have the opportunity to to praise God and and to worship Jesus in a unique way every time that we gather together for worship, and we've got those same opportunities individually. But we want, we should want, to worship in absolute awe and amazement. Do you know the first time the word worship is ever really used in Scripture? We studied it a few weeks ago. It it appears when Abraham was getting ready to take Isaac up the side of the mountain. If you remember this story when we went through it or when you've read it, and and God speaks to Abraham, tells him what he wants him to do, and he says, get the servants and take them so far. And then there's that poignant moment when he says to the servants, hey, you guys stay here. Really what God is saying, you guys don't need to see this. And Abraham takes Isaac up the mountain. But what he says is, hey, you guys stay here. We're going up to worship God. Now, on the surface at that moment, it seemed like it was going to be a horrific worship. And yet it ended up being a time where when Abraham trusted God, God provided in a huge way. God will make a way. But that's when we first see worship introduced. Because worship is always about bringing something. It's about bringing something. Ideally, it's about bringing something precious. What can be more precious than a father sacrificing his son? It's almost like that was a foreshadowing of something that was going to come. The second time that we see, or not the second time, but the first time that we see worship used in the New Testament, in the New Testament, is actually in Matthew chapter 2. It's when the wise men came to worship the baby Jesus. They came to worship, and you remember how they did it? They brought precious gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh, something of a value and worth. And it was a fundamental motive of worship to bring something to God, a song, a prayer, an offering, a focus moment, even our longing for God is a gift to Him. Because you know what God wants most out of us? What God wants most with us is a relationship. And so when we come to worship and say, God, I just, I just want to be with you. I just want more of you and to experience more of you in my life. When we do those things, it is an act of worship in itself because we're saying to a God that wants to have relationship with us, we want to have relationship with you. I don't need to see a show of hands right now, but any parents that are in the room who have raised children, who have grown all the way up and have graduated or at least left your house, you have those moments when you remember when little Johnny was four or five or little Susie was six and they always wanted to come and jump into your arms and they always wanted you to snuggle with them and noogie their head and all those things that we do when they're little and it's so cute and we think it's so, and we don't realize how quickly that's going to fade. And now they're in their 20s or 30s or older. And you would, lo- you would give anything to have them climb up in your lap. 
and to just to be your little child again. See, that's, that, that's where God is. Because we have those moments of desperation. We have those moments of desperation when, when we are slaves to sin and we just want to run to him and, and we feel so awesome when he embraces us in a way that makes us feel safe. And then we grow up. And we grow out of that sincere act of worship of God. I want to be with you. William Temple said, worship is the submission of all of our nature to God. God, here, here's all of it. Here, I'm not holding anything. Here's, here's all of it. So the outcome of our worship is that we get filled up, which is reminds us of our bottom line, that worship empties us of ourself and fills us with the reality of God. And so our motive may be to give God something, but the result is we get something. While we're supposed to be giving to him, we receive his power. We receive his peace. We receive his presence in our lives and we're filled, we're filled by his reality. A lot of you like to read C.S. Lewis stuff. C.S. Lewis wrote these words in the book Mere Christianity. He said, God, excuse me, God designed the human machine to run on himself. He is the fuel of our spirits, and our, our, our spirits were designed to burn. The food our spirits were designed to feed upon, there is no other. And that's worship. But what about this day? What about this, this Palm Sunday day that we're talking about? That day, Jesus created quite a stir coming down the Mount of Olives. He's riding triumphantly into Jerusalem. Now, now you got to think about this and remember this, that for the first 30 years, other than hanging out with his parents and learning at the, at the synagogue and things like that, it was relatively quiet. I mean, and then we get to year 30 and, and he's at this wedding feast in Cana and his mom kind of outs him as to who he really is and performs his first miracle and then everybody knows and now the ministry is on. But even in that, for the last three years, Jesus has been telling his followers and those who witness miracles to keep it on the lowdown. You know, he's, he's helping people that never walk to walk. And it's like, now don't tell anybody. And every time I read one of those stories, I'm thinking, don't you think people were going to notice? Old boy's been laying over there by the pool all his life, can't walk, now he's dancing. Don't think anybody's going to like wonder what's up with that. And the guy that couldn't talk is now speaking. And the guy that couldn't see is no longer running into trees. I mean, they, they're going to figure out something's up. But Jesus like, it's not time. Because he understood if he stirred up too much excitement too soon, the religious leaders would come after him because they wanted to squelch things, which they did. But he typically exercised discretion. For instance, John chapter 7, he went to the Jewish Feast of Tabernacles in Jerusalem. He slipped into town quietly so as to not draw much attention to him. But now, now he rides into Jerusalem as the Messiah. It's unmistakable claim to being God's anointed king. But when we were reading through that, I made the point to mention, this is a donkey. Did you wonder why would a king come in riding on a donkey instead of a chariot or some big white stallion like the Lone Ranger, you know? It's like that, why would he do that? Well, it's actually the sign to the people. Because the prophet Zechariah in Zechariah chapter 9 had told them hundreds of years earlier, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you righteous and having salvation, gentle and, here it is, riding on a donkey, on a colt, on the foal of a donkey. So when Jesus sent the disciples ahead into town, he knew what kind of animal they needed to go get. Because that was the signal. That was the signal of this is it. William Barclay explained that in ancient times, though, it was interesting. In those days and times, kings rode horses into battle, but they rode donkeys in the times of peace. Now, that's quite interesting because although he was the prince of peace, the next seven days were not going to be peaceful. Not by any stretch 
of the imagination. But what a moment. People are waving and people are, are shouting and chanting. There's been this outpouring of praise like, like we hadn't seen since the angels came when Jesus was born and were singing in the heavens, glory to God in the highest. But after 30 years of obscurity in Nazareth and three years of traveling here and preaching there and doing all these things and avoiding riotous actions that might gain too much attention, it was as if the crowd said, we can't hold it in any longer. And suddenly, suddenly it just erupted. It just poured out of them. And the electricity in the air was explosive. But in the crowd were some of the Pharisees that wanted him to be quiet. And when the Pharisees called for silence, Jesus said, even if I were to get them to be quiet, the stones would cry out. Because heaven couldn't wait any longer. Jesus had been discreet long enough. The gig is up. It's time. Can you see the religious leaders in the crowd? I mean, it's breaking out. And, you know, the, at this point in time, they're not, they can't stop it. It's like one man trying to stop an army and, and they couldn't do anything. So I'm sure they, did, they, they want to pretend it wasn't going on. I just kind of imagine them kind of like standing over in the corner with their arms crossed and their back to everything. Like, you know. But you know, the ladder I got every once in a while, they're like sneaking a peek. Like, you, you, you ever, you know, you ever done that? You did something you really didn't want to see, and so you cover your eyes, but then you peek. <laughs> you know, you're at a scary movie. You're in a scary movie and it's getting really, first of all, I know, why did you go there in the first place? That's a different, that's, like, why would you pay money to have someone scare you? Anyway, that's a different thing. Hey, but you're there and you cover your eyes and then like, but I really want to kind of see, you know, we, we do those things. Or, or there's that horrific accident on the side of the road and you know in your heart you should be saying, oh God, please, I hope everybody's okay, but I really want to know what happened there. Who hit who? And like, you know, we, we, and, and so the Pharisees are like, we, we want to ignore this, but we can't ignore this. They wanted not to care, but he was just getting too much attention. John's account of this time says the whole world had gone after him. Like the Pharisees knew, like he's winning. And for the only time during his earthly ministry, Jesus comes into Jerusalem as a king. A misunderstood king, but still a king. There will always be people like the Pharisees that just don't get worship. You're friends with some of them. I know you are. I, I know that some of you every week have friends that maybe they've stopped actually asking you, but you know they're thinking, why in the world do you get up on a beautiful Sunday morning and go sit in a church building? Or for our folks that come on Thursday night, why after a long day of work do you go to church? Why, why do some of you do it both and, and come one and serve the like and people just don't just don't get it at all but in case you didn't know there are people that sit in church every week that don't get it we can't figure out why we why do we have to keep singing new songs weren't the old ones good enough yeah, they were. They were great. They were awesome. They were awesome. But do you know that at least 28 times in the Bible it says, He will put a new song on my heart? Do you know that every hymn and praise song that we sing was once a new song? I'm pretty sure I'm accurate in that. And do you know that some of those songs that like I grew up on, there are great songs, the great hymns that were in those books that you had to squint and read the, you know, see the writing and figure out what all those, you know, dots and things with lines on them were up above it and you didn't know. You know, a lot of those, a lot of the, the musical parts of those songs came straight from bars in Europe. The Christians heard the music in the saloon and thought, huh. I wonder if I could change the words and make something out of that. So it doesn't matter where it came from or when it came. In fact, David, who 
is responsible for a very large section of scripture and was referred to as a man after God's own heart. David was the one who kept talking about singing a new song to the Lord. Now, I've done some math. It's been several thousand years since David died. And if this whole thing of singing a new song to the Lord is really that important to him, that means he's been in heaven for several thousand years now. I'm guessing writing a whole bunch of new songs that we're going to have to sing. And I can't imagine singing in front of Jesus going, yeah, but I like that one that we did in 1985 or in 2023. (laughs) We got to think about this. We got to think about what's really important. And worship is all about priorities. It's about the focus of life. It's about God, not us. We don't worship us. We don't worship the songs that we like. We worship the one the songs are about. We don't worship a preacher. We worship the words that a preacher shares if they're from God's word. That's where our worship is focused. Worship empties us of self and fills us with the reality of God. I want to draw this thing to a close, and I want to go back to that passage in Luke 19 and take a closer look at what happened on the Mount of Olives that day. It says, when he came near the place, this is in verse 37, when he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all of the miracles they had seen. Notice a couple things there. Everybody got involved, and it was loud. It was real loud. That day, coming down the mountain, the only, one that may have, the only ones that may have been standing there with their arms folded are the ones that didn't believe Jesus was who he said he was. Because those who believed in him, it was, it was on. Everyone was involved, and it was loud. So why do we worship him? Let's do this, and we'll call it a day. Because if you get these two things, you got it. We worship him for what he has done. That's what we see here in this passage. it, It was the miracles that brought this outpouring of worship. Because what had been happening over the last three years? Blind people received sight. Lame people were walking. Those who had leprosy no longer had to shout unclean because they were made clean. The dead were even being raised. Friends, Understand this, God is still active today. We're seeing it. I hope you're seeing it, not missing it, because he's still answering prayers. He's still changing hearts. He's still healing bodies and minds and spirits and souls. He's still active. Every day, people are surrendering their lives to the Lord. And when they do, they find peace and hope and strength and joy. And yet, it's happening. Remarkably, it's happening most in the places where the most persecution is going on. And we think God's doing stuff here. But in places around the world where people are being killed on a daily basis— because of their worship of God. In those places, the church is exploding. Exploding. I know places in the world where church members actually have to get tickets to come to worship because they've only got so many seats and they can't have anybody coming for all 12 services and taking up 12 different seats that 11 other people could have come to. That, that's, that, can you imagine that? The places where people are being persecuted the most, worship is exploding. You know what I'm thinking? Bring on the persecution. Worship is being reminded that everything we have, all good things, Our abilities, our resources, our friends, our family, our freedom, our church, our jobs, our schools, our eternal hope, that they're all expression of God's goodness to us. Now, let me warn you of something. 
it's kind of like what we talked about a few months ago. Have you ever given someone a gift and you knew by their expression, maybe it was a child, but maybe it was an adult, maybe it's your spouse, maybe it was somebody like, but you knew by their expression, you had just hit a home run. You knew they loved it. They absolutely loved it. They couldn't, if it's a kid, they couldn't quit playing with a toy. If it was an adult, they couldn't wait to go try it on and show it off or use it if it's an electronic thing. Whatever. They, they, you knew they loved it. And you sat there, and you sat there, and you sat there. And then you went home and sat there by the phone and just kept waiting and waiting and waiting. And nobody... Nobody ever said, thank you. You think God might be waiting on you to say something? Are there those things that you know that you've been blessed with and you love it, that you still haven't taken the time to say, thanks God, thanks God. He created it and sometimes we take it so much for granted that we forget to say thank you for what he's done. So that's the first reason we worship. But the biggest reason we worship is not because of what he has done. The biggest reason that we worship is because of who he is. Luke chapter 19 verse 38 is they're chanting. What were they chanting? Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Now that guy David that I mentioned earlier, he had actually given us those words in Psalm 118. It was a psalm the people knew very well. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And they're praising God for Jesus, their promised Messiah, their promised king. They're acknowledging the identity of Jesus as he comes down the Mount of Olives. And it's also a realization that God himself is worthy of praise. Because if, in fact, worship empties us of self, we need to remember that we aren't the center of the universe, and so we give ourselves completely to God. Completely to God. That's why many of the new songs that we sing are about the identity of God. It's why we started the morning singing, there's joy in the house of the Lord, and we can't keep quiet. We're going to shout out our praise. It's why in just a moment we're going to sing a song that says, God, we're going to make room for you. Because right now there's, there's stuff in my life that I need to get rid of. And so if worship is emptying ourselves out, what we're saying is, God, we're going to empty ourselves out so that we can make room for you. If God never did another thing, if God never did another thing for us, he would still deserve our praise for all that he's already done, for who he is in the first place. So the people in the crowd on that first Palm Sunday, they're just praising. They got it. Well, they almost got it. They almost got it. They were close. They almost got it. They worship Jesus as king, at least for that moment. At least for that moment. But tragically, it didn't last. They were intrigued by Jesus. They just expected a different kind of king. They weren't ready for a king who was going to lay down his life for his kingdom. Are you worshiping Jesus? Are you intrigued by Jesus? That, that misunderstanding raises a question, interesting question. Who is Jesus to you? Is he King Jesus? Is he the Lord over your life 24-7, 365? Or just when you need him? Does, does your life model true worship of being empty to self and filled with the reality of God? I want you to think about that crowd that day as they're coming down the hill into Jerusalem. Who would have been in that crowd? We don't know all the people. We know some of them. We know some of them that would have been there. I'll guarantee you this dude named Bartimaeus was there. And the cool thing about it was he could see what was happening. But he used to be blind. And they ask him, what happened? He's like, I don't know. All I know is 
I was blind and now I can see. Isn't that really all that's important at that moment? Undoubtedly, there was a there was a guy that was a close friend named Lazarus. I bet he was there. I bet he was there. People are asking, dude, I thought you were dead. <laughs> I was. What happened? I don't know. I was just laying there and all of a sudden I heard my name, so I got up and went out. Because Jesus called my name. And then there was undoubtedly this other guy named Nicodemus. Nicodemus ends up playing an even bigger part, but Nicodemus was in the crowd as a secret disciple, a kind of an undercover disciple who ultimately stood up when it was time to be counted. And there were so many more people that prayed then and now. Gives us more chance to respond to King Jesus. So that's what Palm Sunday is, is all about. We praise Jesus for who he is and for what he's done. And we surrender ourselves completely to him. Because the bottom line is, worship empties us of self and fills us with the reality of God. Why'd you come today? What's worship to you? Do you need to get filled with the reality of God in a way that you've never been before? Do you need to accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? We hope so. Like I said, we got, we got three baptisms we know of happening in just a few minutes. Come on and join the party. Let's go. Let's go. Or maybe you just need to pray where you are. Maybe you need to get up and go over to our prayer area and just quietly by yourself kneel or sit and pray. Or maybe you just need to stand up and sing as loud as you can. God, I'm going to make room for you. I'm getting myself out of the way and I'm opening the doors so that you can come in and live in me and live through me and make a difference in the world today. So whatever it is that he's telling you to do, let's stand up right now. Let's sing and you do what God's telling you to do today.
like it was that day going down into Jerusalem. And this week we get to celebrate what we know is the rest of the story. All right? And it's going to be awesome. So remember the service times that I, I sent Stu a, ch- a text last night. I'm changing it up a little bit because we were just going to do the same thing Thursday and then do it again on Sunday. But that seemed kind of weird because it was like we were getting him out of the grave on Thursday. Then we were putting him back in the grave on Friday. Then we were going to get him out again on Sunday. So we're not going to do that. All right. Uh, Thursday, we're actually going to spend a lot of time talking about that night of the Last Supper. And that time in the Garden of Gethsemane and not my will. And then Friday night we'll talk about, we'll talk about the horror of the crucifixion and the burial. And then Sunday, Sunday it's on. Sunday it's on. So that's what's going on this week. And invite your friends. If you don't have the, the bumper sticker, get it at least for a week. If you don't have the, the cards, get some. I know there's still some here. I'm out in the lobby. Grab some of these and start passing them out this week. Grab the egg cards. I see some of them are already starting to come back in. And let's just see what God is going to do in a huge, huge way. If this is your first time here, man, thanks for being here. Stop out at the I'm New Wall. We got a gift for you. If you've ordered a t-shirt there in the back, and if some of you guys could help us for like five minutes get the curtains up before the next service that would be awesome it's going to be a great week I'm glad you guys were here let's go love God love people watch him change the world